We're covering analysis of variance uh, and its various permutations. Uh, hopefully the data camp material made more sense this week than usual, because I'm assuming everybody in here has already had ANOVA. So this should not be new stuff, uh, but rather should just be uh, an exploration of how do we use the tools we have available in R in order to conduct analyses that we already do. Uh, so I, I, I took that approach. That's why there were two full courses. If this was the first time you'd ever seen ANOVA, we would have taken that much more slowly. Uh, but uh, assuming that you've, you've seen all this before, uh, it, it should have been mostly review. Uh, today is going to be a little different than in previous weeks because we're going to cover a lot of new stuff in here today. Uh, things that round out the material that you got in data camp, uh, things that you would actually need to do in order to, you know, write a publishable paper using ANOVA uh, that weren't necessarily covered in uh, the data camp material. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that, that issue first. Uh, second, I'm going to uh, talk about um, sort of using AOV, the command you talked about. Um, there's actually uh, some reasons why you probably would not use almost any of the things you talked about in Data Camp, uh, which we will talk about in here as well, um, because uh, the AOV function in uh, R has some defaults that are not the same as what you are accustomed to doing in like SPSS or in other programs. Um, which may or may not matter for the particular things you're doing, so we'll talk about that. Uh, I am going to talk about a lot of new stuff. Uh, we are going to cover maybe 14, 15 packages uh, that have different functions that you might need to use uh, for both this week's project as well as uh, for the kind of write-ups you would do uh, if you're putting together a published paper. So we're going we're gonna to tackle it all. Um, the AOV stuff, though, that you covered, that will be kind of the, the default. So why was this data camp so different? Uh, why was this course not really very tidy? You, you were asked to use ggplot, I think, at one point. Um, but for the most part, this was not using tidy notation. Like, there was a lot of L applies and weird calculations that, that go back several weeks um, to the kind of way that we, we approached uh, things. Um, we generally don't like to use base R when we're taking kind of a data science-y approach. So uh, why did we do that? Um, you did see uh, a lot of the weird and ugly base R uh, figure creation stuff. Uh, those, those figures often do not look pretty uh, unless you do a lot of finagling to try to make them look a little bit better, uh, and we didn't talk about that at all. Um, sometimes it's not possible to avoid base R work. Uh, there are certain cases where using something like tidyverse actually makes things harder, uh, and there's also certain cases where the functions you're trying to use just do not appreciate or take advantage of a tidy uh, structure. So as a result, you do need to know, that's why we covered base R first. That's why we still did that. Um, a lot of modern data science courses uh, actually skip base R entirely and only cover like tidyverse. Uh, that's why we didn't do that. Because for the stuff that we need, sometimes we need to dip back into base R pretty extensively. Why did this happen though? So ANOVA is not real common outside of social science and really outside of psychology. The major reason for that, uh, and actually I don't know how uh, you necessarily learned ANOVA, but ANOVA is a type of regression, uh, and regression is a type of what we would call the general linear model. So as a result, most people that are doing modern statistics don't use ANOVA. So they usually use some more general version of it, uh, like some type of ordinary least squares linear regression or some type uh, of uh, further general linear model, things like logistic regression, those kind of things. Um, so as a result, ANOVA is really a very psych slash social science kind of thing to do. Uh, so that's why you don't really see much extensive data science material, nor do you see much effort to integrate ANOVA functions into things like tidyverse. That won't be true for regression. Uh, regression is a much broader set of tools, and the general linear model is very common throughout data science work, so you'll see a lot of that. Um, but yeah, that's why it happens. Uh, psychology is in general kind of stuck in the like early to mid 20th century in terms of its stats. Uh, that's starting to change a little bit, uh, but not real quick. Uh, if you take, uh, if you look back historic historically, like we have correlation was introduced in 1880, um, which was a uh, Galton. We had t tests in 1908. We had uh, the concept of variance 1918. ANOVA was invented in 1921. Uh, they're not new tests. These are kind of old things to do. Which is not to say that they don't give you useful information, but it just means that if you look in the stats community, if you start to follow the things going on in statistics, or even in uh, modern quant psych, uh, you will see that they don't really deal with this kind of thing very much. That said, uh, I recognize that uh, for certain fields, ANOVA is still very standard, uh, so we're definitely going to talk about it here. Also, I think it is useful to talk about ANOVA because it is a simpler case 
in many ways of most of the regression models that we will talk about next time. Uh, so that means that uh, it's a good kind of introduction uh, to this general, to the concept of the general linear model. So that's where we're going to do it. Uh, a lot of these things did become popular in that era because of computational simplicity. It's a lot harder to do uh, uh, the calculations by hand without a calculator involved in the general linear model. So ANOVA was a much simpler way with its basic sum of squares. You're just taking differences and squaring them. Like, it's a lot easier to do when you're writing out your calculations out by hand. In the modern era, it's not really as necessary. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit today about the site package, uh, which is something you're probably going to become pretty familiar with. It's a set of function for doing quote-unquote traditional psychological uh, tests and analyses. It includes both classical test theory and item response theory-based functions. It's a lot of flexibility to it. Uh, it includes tools for a lot of traditional psych problems. We, we'll dip into it a little today, a little bit more next week. It'll pop up throughout the rest of the course. Um, but we've got things like uh, doing ANOVAs is in there, uh, doing factor analysis, uh, basic item scoring. Uh, if you think about things in tidy, like how would you do weighted scoring, for example? If you had a cognitive ability test uh, or a knowledge test or any test with right answers and you had mo four multiple choice items per question uh, and you had 50 of those items, you can just imagine the ridiculous tidyverse thing you would have to do in order to mutate just a huge number of things. Uh, and Psych has functions where you basically create a matrix of weights and then you just say, score it for me, and it just does it. So it has a lot of things to make stuff that we commonly do uh, in kind of a social science angle a lot easier. Uh, it also has some data simulation stuff. It has some uh, graph stuff that makes the graphing a little bit easier. Um, you, we will, for example, today talk about marginal means plots, which wasn't really covered. Uh, actually, I don't think it was at all covered in the data camp material. Uh, so things like that, Psych makes it a little bit easier. Um, the philosophy of that package is very obvious once you start digging into it. It's, here are things that people typically do in SAS and SPSS, uh, but are hard to do in R. <laughs> so Psych takes a lot of that stuff uh, for us. So we'll, we'll dip a little bit into it. Um, not super extensively, but a little bit today. Um, it'll come up a lot more. Things that you uh, will find useful in, uh, in Psych is, uh, well, actually find as a general one, is describe and describe by. And you use describe by actually in uh, Data Camp, I think which just gives you all of the basic psych-oriented stats that we typically do. Uh, if I, for example, do library psych, and then I do subscribe by MT cars, uh, you can get all of a kind of our standard psych-oriented stuff, me uh, means and medians, minimums and maximums, skew and kurtosis estimates, standard errors, all that stuff that you would think of like, oh, if I ran descriptives in SPSS, what would pop up? So this is the kind of logic uh, that you see a lot. Uh, oh, and I use describe by instead of describe. Describe, allow uh, describe by allows you to specify a grouping variable so that you can look at, like, in an ANOVA sense, which is where we'll use it, you can look at two groups split by all their descriptives. So... It's just like the kind of the standard stuff that we would normally do uh, in, uh, in most of our psych research. If you ever forget where a function came from, but you have it loaded in your workspace, by the way, uh, the find command is in base R. Uh, I find it really useful uh, because I sometimes, especially when playing around with functions and trying to figure out what will work, I load like 50 different packages and I'm trying like, does this work? No, that doesn't make sense. Try a different package. That didn't work. That didn't make sense. And I finally settle on a specific function that I like, and I forgot where it came from. So just the find function, which is base R, will tell you what package a function came from as long as it's currently loaded in your workspace. So it's a good way to make sure that your list of libraries at the top of your scripts is always only containing functions that you're actually using. Because uh, it's not useful to just list like 50 packages up there because you won't remember what's coming from where. And they also sometimes conflict with each other, so it's important not to do that. Okay. Oh, one package that, uh, or one data set that's included in Psych that we'll use a lot in here is going to be uh, SAT.ACT, which is actually a database of some demographic variables plus SAT and ACT scores. Uh, if I just look at it, uh, you will see, well, uh, this is why knowing where your libraries come from is so important. There we go. So if you look at it, you're going to see you're going to have gender variable and education variable and age variable and then ACT, SAT scores. Uh, it's just a convenient little data set to play with that comes with uh, Psych. There's also a data data set called BFI, uh, which contains uh, Big Five uh, scores on the Big Five inventory as well as demographics. So these are just handy to play with and are a little more familiar kind of data sets for, uh, uh, for us than like the empty cars is. Okay, we skip t-tests. 
Uh, there was an entire course on t-tests. Uh, I thought that was a little overkill uh, because the notation is exactly the same as ANOVA, uh, except it uses the t-test function. So if you do need a t-test, uh, you can use t.test and using the same formula notation that we've been using, uh, y on x in this case, for a grouping variable. Alternatively, you can actually specify all the scores individually. So if you have one variable full of scores in one group, one variable scores in the other group, uh, you can do it set, uh, scores, comma, scores. And if that's a paired samples, then you have to use this guy down here, paired equals true, uh, in order to specify that. If you want to do a one sample t-test, you can do uh, your variable, comma, mu equals uh, whatever your mu is. Uh, there's also all sorts of variations for this, if you want. Uh, one thing to keep in mind with t-tests is t-tests, by default, in R, do not assume equal variances. So usually you do a test for that in, uh, in if you're taking an SPSS approach, as you see that, like, equal variance is assumed versus equal variance is not assumed thing. Uh, equal variance is not assumed actually does a change called, uh, a, it's, a, it's a Welch's adjustment to the degrees of freedom. It gives you these sometimes like partial degrees of freedom. That's by default in this. Uh, there's actually some research uh, on how that actually is a better default. In most cases, even if your variances are actually equal, they're probably not exactly equal. You're probably underpowered to detect that they're not equal. So Welch's is usually actually what you want anyway. But if you want this to like equal the same as your SPSS output, then you're probably going to want to use var dot equal equals true. Uh, you can also specify uh, any confidence level you want on t-test. But otherwise, I mean, it's it's the same as ANOVA if, uh, notation wise. Uh, so if you need a t-test, this is how you do it. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure that you were aware of that. Okay, the ANOVA framework. So ANOVA in uh, in R actually is with a function called ANOVA that is all lowercase, and that's going to be important in a minute. Uh, AOV is a wrapper around the ANOVA function, which gives you all the kind of standard output that we come to expect associated with ANOVA. Uh, it's part of base R's stats package. Uh, stats is where it is automatically, it's a library automatically included when you open R. It's included with R, but it is still a package. Uh, uses formula notation again. Uh, y on x, y on x1 plus x2, y on x1 uh, by x2, and y on x1 plus x1 plus x1 and the e crossed with x2, which is what that notation means. Understanding formula notation is going to be super important for us. Uh, so uh, let me step through what these are. This just means you have two, you have two uh, variables that you're examining, x1 and x2. The star really means this. These last two lines are identical. X1 by X2, this is a crossing in uh, formula notation, and this star just means include this, this, and the interaction between them. If you keep including stars, it will automatically create all of the interactions that are possible based on that. So if I did X1 star X2 star X3 star X4, I would have a four-way interaction in that model. If you want to have fewer than that, then you have to specify it manually, like this. So if you wanted to have four variables but only uh, three-way interactions, and then only some of them, like you want to do unbalanced interactions, you did that like specification factorial thing in SPSS, uh, then you would need to specify all the interactions individually. So x1, x2, x3, x1 by x2, x1 by x3, x1 by x2 by x3, etc. So you would have to do that all manually, but they're basically the same idea. In order to do a homogeneity of variance tests, you're probably going to use Levine tests. This was covered in, uh, uh, in data camp. Uh, basically, you are going to specify either the individual variables that you're examining or the model, depending on what you want. You're probably going to do the model in most cases. Uh, you can test sphericity using Moshley's te Moshley tests. You can do normality checks using GG pairs and describe by in psych to get just basic printout information. You can do Shapiro tests to do a Shapiro Wilk normality test, which, uh, by the way, I'm assuming you know all the words I'm using, so if any of this is confusing, please stop me. Uh, you can do Shapiro tests the same way. All of these take either the uh, variable variable or the formula notation, so just check the help file for each one if you need them. Uh, independence assumptions, of course, are based on your research design, so check that on your own. Um, but otherwise, these are the functions that you're generally going to need in order to do uh, your basic assumption checks. Um, again, always do both. Always a visual check plus your uh, statistical checks. Don't, don't just do one or the other. Quick and dirty way to do uh, assumption checking visualizations. This is one of my favorite libraries. This is the YAR library. The YAR library does what are called pirate plots. And what pirate plots are is a type of RDI plot, which is a type of plot that I would really recommend that you become familiar with. RDI stands for Raw Data Description and Inference. It is a uh, basically a best practices way to display data descriptively uh, by group. 
Raw data means you literally get a sort of uh, little individual dots representing the raw data. Description in the case of this, in the case of the pirate plot, is that you get a thick line representing the center of the data, and by default, this is the median, as well as a density plot. Uh, in this case, a violin plot representing how uh, uh, how dense the data is at each point. And then finally, you get an inferential rectangle. By default, this will be an HDI, which is a Bayesian concept. Uh, it's essentially what you would call a credibility interval. Uh, but you can do a confidence interval instead if you prefer that. Uh, a Bayesian high-density interval with no prior or a, a naive prior is basically this identical to a confidence interval anyway, so they're very similar, uh, even if you don't change the defaults. So let me show you what that looks like, uh, because you will see why this is so useful in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of visualization. And then we're going to use, in this case, BFI, I guess, uh, I'm going to do BFI, let me forget the notation. Yeah, it's formula-based. So data equals BFI, and then I'm going to add in an actual formula, which I think is the first term, but I'm not going to assume that. Let's say we were looking at differences in A1 by gender. Yeah, let's do that. So we end up with, it's a little weird because we're, because obviously uh, Likert type data is not really, uh, not really ratio or interval level measurement. It's really ordinal. So we're seeing all these little like gaps here. Uh, but you can see this density plot and you can see in the center, it's actually not a really good illustration of this. Let me, let me just find that one. Um, you know what? I'm going to use empty cars. I'm pretty sure this one works. There we go. So this is an illustration of, from the empty cars data set. I've essentially just done uh, what you consider an ANOVA of uh, miles per gallon on cylinders. We've used this one before. You can see kind of why they're called pirate plots, because the violin is like the ship, and the center line is the mast, and this is a sail, right? So it's like little pirate ships, kind of. So pirate plots gives you all this information. The advantage of this is you can actually see the raw data there. You can see dot, dot, dot. It's done as jitter, so that's, there's no meaning to the left and right here. Uh, and you can see the median, and you can see the HDI, the interval, uh, right there. It's a really convenient way to look at uh, outlying data, and also to look at kind of where your uh, inference is occurring, and why. It's very easy to see multimodal distributions uh, in this case, like there's an outlier right there. Uh, it looks kind of multimodal, but it's really because there's just one case off to the very bottom. Uh, and it's a really quick way to get a lot of information in a way that's a lot better than uh, doing something like uh, you saw them described as dynamite plots using basic bar graphs with error bars uh, or doing even box plots. You just get a lot more information out of this. So uh, really recommend uh, taking a look at that. Uh, can only be used for up to three IVs, though, so that's uh, one downside to this particular platform. The major reason for that is once you have three IV crossings, there's so many little graphs there anyway, you can't really see them. Uh, so it's really for the best regardless. If you want to use confidence intervals, all you have to do is change this uh, one term, inf.method equals ci. Uh, otherwise, by default, this is inf.method equals hdi for the Bayesian interval. So ci just changes it over. All right, here are your basic models for uh, ANOVA. Uh, I would recommend referring to this slide in the future. Uh, you can see a one-way model is pretty easy. In all cases here, you can save the results of this to a variable. I've only done that in the first example, but you can do that in all of them. Uh, AOV of y on b1, AOV of y on b1 times star b2, or this interaction version is your basic two-way ANOVA, your three-way ANOVA right here, although I could define that using individual interaction terms if I wanted. With blocking order effects and covariates, you would use something like this. Really important point here, always put your covariates first. I will explain why in a little bit, uh, but for simplicity, we're going to just take that as a rule for a few slides. Uh, always put your covariates, order effects, anything that you're adding in as the first term. Uh, two, for within subjects, uh, and you have to first restructure your data so that you have one single column uh, of values. It's a weird way of thinking about it. We are accustomed to rows in being people in psych. That's just usually what we're examining. Rows are people and uh, columns are observations. In the with his subjects, subjects context, it's not that way. Uh, rows are observations, which means if you have multiple observations per person, then you need to have one row per observation, multiple rows per person. So that means you would need to uh, uh, restructure your data. I'll talk about that again in a little bit using things like gather and spread from tidyverse. 
Uh, here's an example of uh, once you've done that, you're, you're within uh, one factor within subject with however many levels you want. It doesn't matter. Uh, you have to define this error term because by default there is no error term in ANOVA. You're literally building the formula yourself when you do ANOVA in, uh, in R. So there's no, uh, there's a lot of like hand holding in SPSS where it's just like, oh, just let me conceptually think of what things are. R doesn't do that. R makes you actually specify what your formula is manually. So if you define this error term, you need to have some sort of subject ID variable and then you put a slash uh, over the uh, uh, over the term that you want. So, oh, that actually should be W1. That should not be an A, sorry. <coughs> so this would be subject ID slash W1, uh, and uh, that would create your basic one factor within subjects uh, ANOVA, uh, which is really an RM ANOVA, a repeated measures ANOVA. For two factor, uh, you just carry this out. So you see uh, W1 times W2, and then you add more into the error term here. Uh, and that will give you all the pieces that you need. Mixed models are where things get weird. Uh, it starts to get, a, and if you're not real familiar with exactly what's happening in a mixed model ANOVA, like what the terms are, this can be really confusing. Uh, just because, again, we're kind of used to the plug and play of SPSS, uh, which is, uh, I would say, not good anyway. Uh, so this allows you to actually very uh, purposely draw out what's happening. Uh, in a one factor plus one way, meaning you have something like a two by two or three by two or whatever, the two individual factors, one within and one between, uh, we would define it with only the within factor inside our error term. And again, if you ever did this in SPSS, you've seen this structure based on what the plots spit out, um, but it's important to, to specify it by hand here. For a two-way plus one factor, the additional thing that you have to do is specify the between subjects interaction separately, because the way that formulas work here is if it's a with, if there's any within terms in this uh, interaction right here, then what's going to happen, uh, oh, and that's, man, there's a lot of errors in here. That parenthesis should actually be there. Sorry about that. Should move that. Should be over there. Uh, I think. Actually, no, that parenthesis shouldn't be there at all. Sorry. There's a parenthesis right there at the end of B2. Just scratch that out. I will update these slides, too, but um, for now, scratch that out. Uh, yeah, so if you have any within subject term inside a multiplicative term in a formula, it will treat this all as a within subjects factor. So you're going to get this within subjects factor interacting with the between subjects factors, but you're not going to get a between subjects interaction. So that means you have to add that term out here. Okay, so that's all that's happening. And we can carry that out a little bit further. If we had a two way by two factor, it would be structured like this. This is your within factor interaction and your error term is still defined uh, entirely by this guy, uh, and then we have uh, the B1 times B2. So, uh, so yeah, you just for whatever your structure is, you're going to have to build out that formula, and then make sure to double check that the output matches the kind of things you were expecting to see. Uh, you can get a lot of diagnostic plots. Uh, this is not with ggplot, but these are with base R using plot and then model. Uh, which is very important, uh, and you should very much get used to doing those kind of diagnostic plots. Uh, let's say, uh, let's say we're in BFI still. Uh, let's say we're going to do an ANOVA of A1 on the interaction between gender. No, let's not do that. Let's do an ANCOVA of age plus gender as a factor. I don't know if it'll let me do that. Oh, whoops. Data equals BFI. So model gets, we can get summary information about this ANOVA by using, oh, I don't have a legal one because gender only has two conditions. Let's do, all right, this will not actually be an ANOVA. <laughs> We're going to do it this way. There we go. So sorry, there are only two conditions in gender, so that was breaking. So if we look at, uh, let's pretend that 05 is a nominal variable. It's not, but whatever. Uh, so pretend that 05 is correct, we have our basic summary model by using summary and then that on the result of AOV. But what you can do then is plot the results of the model. I'll be accustomed to doing these with ANOVA, but they still apply the same way. Uh, fitted values versus residuals. In general, there should be no correlation here. Uh, hit return. We see a, a QQ plot. You can see we got some tails here, but it's for the most part actually okay-ish. Uh, a little bit, a little bit off, but not too bad. Uh, and then we get a fitted values versus standardized residual, or square root of standardized residuals plot. 
uh, which should also be no relation. So you can see in this case, we actually have a bit of a relationship. So that would be a little bit of a problem. Uh, finally, we end up with uh, leverage versus standardized residual plot. Again, should be no relationship. So all of those are available if you just hit plot model. <laughs> so if you're just checking uh, assumptions of your general linear model, again, both ANOVA and regression, uh, then you can very quickly get kind of an eyeball of how, how those things look. Uh, so yeah, that's a, a really super important aspect of that. If you don't get full ANOVA tables, and I just, I just demonstrated this, if you don't get full ANOVA tables from summary, uh, like uh, when I did this here, uh, you notice that uh, when I tried to do the summary, I got an error. That means that something about your ANOVA specification is probably wrong. Uh, so if you're pretty confident that the variables you have should create an ANOVA, but they don't, then that means you probably misspecified it. It's just a useful kind of diagnostic step. <coughs> of course, if it does work, it doesn't mean you specified it correctly, but it's at least a, uh, a first step. All right. Bridging tidyverse. Between subjects is real easy. Because the way that we traditionally collect data, you're going to have one observation per person, and you're going to have some number of predictor variables or uh, grouping variables per person. And you can just run your ANOVA models on that, on that stuff. Uh, within subjects, it's harder. As I mentioned earlier, you're going to need to have one column per observation within, uh, within person is usually what, we, uh, usually what we do. So meaning that for participant one, we'll have rows one, two, three for observations one, two, three. But in, uh, for, to run ANOVA, you need one literal observation per row. So that has to be restructured. The easiest way to do that uh, is using gather. We move on post hoc tests. Uh, post hoc tests with, are you done? Uh, if you want to do basic uh, alpha adjusted post hoc tests using pairwise.t.test, uh, you can adjust the specific type of p adjust you want to do. This is for Bonferroni, Holm, Hochberg, Hommel, Hommel etc. Uh, whichever type that you want to use. If you do question mark pairwise t-test, you can get a full, dis uh, a full list of all of these. Uh, pairwise t-test. Uh, and you can, yep, you can see some examples of that. You can see Bonferroni being used down here. Uh, p-adjust is where all of those types are, uh, which is this list right here, home through by. And if you scroll down and look at this list, you can actually see descriptions, citations, all the different kind of ways that you can do this. Uh, this is only, however, for p-adjusted techniques. So if you want to do something that involves a different distribution of, uh, 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 that uses something other than the adjustment of those p-values to determine significance, like if you want to do two key, for example, then you can't use that. So this is for anything that involves just a straight multiplication or division of p-values. Uh, anything else, you have to use something else. If you want to do pairwise, uh, this is your general uh, general format. Here's the other data set, sat.act. Uh, and you can see pairwise is done on y and then x, and then the type of adjustment is specified in the last term. So that would just give you a whole spit out of pairwise t-tests. Uh, Tukey HSD can be done for poke top tests, which it actually works for both... Um, uh, it works well for, uh, for both linear model and, or not for linear model, sorry. Uh, it, it works well for both within and between subjects ANOVAs. Uh, so you don't actually have to change anything about this in the way that you would up here. Uh, but it does not work in certain cases. It does not work real well uh, with covariates. It does not work real well with uh, linear model specifications either. Uh, but I will replace that with something else in a few slides. So you learned about this. I'm going to replace it very slightly, and then we'll come back to it. Effect size calculations occurs using eta squared. That actually comes from the LSR package. Uh, in Data Camp, all of this, all the libraries were preloaded for you, so you didn't have to load anything by hand. Uh, if you need to use eta squared in our studio, though, you need LSR. Uh, that's real easy. Use eta squared and then the model, comma, ANOVA equals T. And what ANOVA equals T does is it gives you the full ANOVA output with the etas. Uh, if you leave out ANOVA equals T, you just get the effect sizes. So e either of those is fine. The numbers aren't any different. Um, but you do have to worry about, um, depending on what you want to see on the output. For post hoc tests, if you want to have more flexible post hoc testing, you're going to need what's called the MultComp package. <coughs> there is a version of MultComp already installed. If you need to update MultComp, you can't do it inside our studio. You will get an error. Uh, if you want to install MultComp, what you're going to have to do is close our studio and open our GUI, the, just the raw R thing that we haven't dealt with in a lot of weeks. Um, and if you, uh, from there, do install packages multcomp, then it will work in our studio too. You just have to install it in the R GUI. Makes sense? So if you haven't used our GUI in a while, uh, in a while 
that is this file, which is just your real basic R. Um, so if you want to install MultComp, you have to do it in there. Uh, once you have MultComp, you gain access to uh, a function, which is this guy, uh, which is General Linear Hypothesis Test, GLHT, which allows you to do individual contrast tests and uh, more complicated things. Uh, so say, for example, we take this command right here, uh, take the SAT, ACT, and I include just these two, fa uh, these two factors, uh, education and gender with a SAT Q value as the outcome. I can throw that into an ANOVA. You should recognize this as just SATQ as the DV and education as the IV. And then we can run a post hoc, two key post hoc test on that using that command. I would not recommend at this point that you try to understand what is happening inside that command. I would instead just recommend that you know you need to put the model in, whatever your model variable is, and you need to put in each variable name equals and then the name of the test you want. In this case, two key. Although there's several others in there. Uh, so if you want to do two key post hoc tests, you will find in certain cases using two key HSD will not work. Uh, and this will. So do this instead. Uh, if you need multi-way post hocs, things get, a, get more complicated. So if you're doing something like a two by two and you need post hocs, you have to explain to R which contrasts you want and in what order. The easiest way to do that is with this command, interaction. Uh, which will actually create a whole set of new variables that you can conduct co contrast tests on. So let me show you how that works. Oh, we're already there. So first of all, let me create this data set. Again, SAT, ACT is inside uh, the site package. So we're just creating a new version of that variable with, uh, or a new version of that data set with a few variables predefined. In this case, a gender variable, an education variable, an SATQ, and ACT. So assume, let's say that I wanted to use ACT as a covariate, and I was going, you would never actually do this. This doesn't make any sense conceptually. But let's say I was using SATQ as a covariate, and I was looking at the interaction between education and gender in the prediction of SATQ. Okay? So this is a two-way between subjects and COVA that I've just written. So now I have a model, uh, and I can look at that model really easily. Uh, you can see in this case that there is not an interaction, but there is a gender effect. Uh, uh, and there's an effect of the covariate, which you would expect, because the covariate is the ACT predicting the SAT. Um, no interaction, but if there was an interaction, we would want to look at all of the post hoc tests associated with this ANOVA. Uh, in order to do that, I need to create this interaction variable. And I will show you by running it what it does. I mean, you should be able to also to copy paste all of this from. Should be able to copy all of this from uh, the PDF directly if you want to try this on your own, which I would recommend. Uh, also, just very quickly, random grider library because I'm using that function. Does everybody remember what that means? Maybe kinda. No. Okay. So real quickly, all that does is that is the same as this. Those are identical, 100%. So all using the gridder and that symbol does is means I don't have to write the name of the data set twice. Literally the only thing that does. So don't be confused. Okay. So now that I've run that, what changed about it, and you can see it right there, it's created a variable indicating the crossings for each, uh, can, for each case. You see that? So by running in the interaction command, it basically just says, well, for every case of education and every case of gender, put them next to each other and put the letter X in between them and increase these condition terms. I then use that variable to specify my uh, post hoc model, which is this guy. So now what I've done is I created a new one. I've replaced that interaction term with an entirely new variable, which is the one I just created as interaction. See that? And then when I run post hocs on that using GLHT, That's Cox. Post Cox. You get the full set of interactions uh, right there. And if I do summary, whoop, not posterior, post Cox. It will take a little bit because it's running a lot of significance tests right now. Uh, and then it will report back uh, all of those individual contrast tests plus all of their individual p-values, and there they are.
So now that's your traditional kind of post hoc cell by cell comparison that you would get from SPSS output. Okay. So in this case, it's comparing condition one by one, which uh, I think I multiplied education by gender, right? Or did I? Uh, da, 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 or the other way. Yep, education then gender. So that means that this is level one of education by level one of gender times level zero of education times level one of gender. And if I had given those labels first, they would appear in this list. So right now there's no labels. Like these, these are just factors as numbers, so there's no labels here. But if, for example, I had recoded gender as you know, male and female, then instead of that one, when I ran interaction, it would have the word male or the word female. Okay. So... Okay, so that was a lot of steps, but that's how you, oh, I, I don't know what I just did right there. There we go. So that's uh, how you do post-hoc tests. <laughs> Does that step-by-step -step make sense, at least, I hope? Yeah, okay, great. So we move forward from post-hocs. Output. How do we bridge tidyverse and uh, AOV? The easiest way uh, to do it is with something in the broom package called tidy. And what tidy does is it converts models into tidy compliant data frames. So right now, for example, all of the, that output, uh, summary post hocs, let's actually save it as a variable. Uh, it's going to take a second to run again. What it does is it actually saves it as a really complicated object in R uh, that is very difficult to access. Uh, once it's done, I will show you kind of what this is. Uh, if I do class my post hocs, you will see, for example, it is a GLHT object. Uh, and if we try to glimpse it, I don't even know what will happen. Yeah, we get a crazy multi-structured hierarchical thing. Okay. So you usually don't want that. If I, for example, wanted to throw all of those post hoc results into a table, I would have to individually hunt down the specific, like, pattern of dollar signs that would get me there. So that is very unpleasant, and I would not do that. Instead, what you can do is use the broom library and run, uh, what did I even just call that? Post talk something? My post talks. I'm going to save this as better. And in fact, I'm just going to open it. And you'll see what it's done is it's changed it into a data frame, and all of that information is now just located in variables. This then becomes the input for whatever you want. So this becomes the input to create tables. This becomes the input to create a ggplot, whatever you're going to do with it. But now everything is in nice, ordinary, tidy format instead of the crazy hierarchical thing we had before. Tidy can be used with a lot of stuff. It can be used with most model summaries. It can be used with post hocs. It can be used with basically anything that's in a strange class format you can convert down to something you can use using tidy. So it's very important, uh, very useful. At this point, I could then do kind of all your ordinary normal things. I could take uh, this new data set and throw it into ggplot as input and apply an aesthetic and just run it. So uh, yeah, that's the key to getting numbers that you can use in R out of these objects. Okay. okay. So that means any time that you want to go from output of test to input in something else, tidy is the middle step. So that is uh, super useful in a lot of contexts. Uh, a similar function is done by APA tables. Now the APA tables library is super useful, uh, and I really strongly recommend it. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and set a working directory because I need to output some files real quick. Uh, I'm going to set it to the desktop. Uh, and then I'm going to actually export the um, ANOVA we just did, if I can find it. Uh, I'm just scrolling up here. Oh, model. So there's our ANOVA model. Uh, if I look at summary model, you're going to get this output. That is not real APA compliant, number one. Number two, it's in the weird untidy version also. So two things you could do at this point. One, I could do tidy summary model, and that will give me, uh, actually I can't do tidy summary model, I can only do tidy model, I think. Yeah. Tidy model will get me the, all of those numbers in a data frame, but that's still not super useful. Uh, instead, what I probably want to do is APA dot, uh, I'm going to have to go check, APA dot AOV dot table, 
And then I'm going to put model into it. And then I'm going to put confidence level equals 0.95. And then I'm going to, actually before that, I'm going to put a file name. Let's call this output dot dot. That's going to think for a minute. And then it's going to do something kind of neat. I drop to desktop real quick. What that did is automatically generate that table. So this allows you to move directly from R to publication output. Done. You copy paste from this stage. So at this, this is how you get the output from basically anything that you do in R out back to something for a paper. Okay. Do not copy paste things ever. It is a bad practice. You should not be copy pasting into or out of R. Only, only uh, process input, process tables uh, using things like reader, reads at CSV, et cetera, to get them in. And then use APA tables to get them out. Or you can even reformat a table yourself and create this if you really wanted to. Uh, there's no real magic to it. So if you wanted to create, uh, this is the way that you create data pipelines. This is the end stage, right? So I've mentioned data pipelines a lot of times. A data pipeline should start with importing data and should end with final tables and figures exported to files. Like that is the data pipeline. Uh, this means that if you discovered at some point, for example, that, uh, that, oh no, I talked to my advisor about my project and it, my advisor said I did everything wrong because I forgot to flip one variable at step two. Well, now all you have to do is go back to uh, your original R code, change that one line, I'm just making this a little prettier. Change that one line and then re-output all your tables again. It literally takes five seconds to change a mistake that you made four hours ago in terms of your analysis. That's an advantage, one of the major advantages of R. So always end with this final output spitting out to a Word document uh, in terms of whatever, out, whatever analyses you're doing. Uh, that's really, I mean, that's, again, really the major selling point or one of the major selling points of R. You can do this for a variety of types of uh, outputs using uh, APA tables. There's APA oneway.table, which outputs descriptive statistics uh, based on a uh, one-way uh, uh, yeah, one design. You can do a APA two-way.table in order to do a two-way design. If you have more than a two-way design, this basically gives you cell means, like means and standard deviations for each cell. If you want to do more than that, uh, then you'll need to use tidy functions to split your data apart into whatever you want your separate panels to be. Um, and if you ever had to do descriptive statistics for like a three or four way ANOVA, you know it's a lot of tables. So you need to explicitly make that decision as to how you're splitting it up and then create it yourself. Uh, you can also do APA.D.Table, and what it'll do is it'll spit out D statistics and confidence intervals for every cell by cell comparison. So that's useful for post hoc tests, uh, for, for uh, putting them into a table. So yeah, this is all in the APA tables library. Again, new libraries all over the place in here. All right, added complexity. Now, before I get into this, I'm going to ask you a question, and it's very important that everybody has the same answer. In your ANOVA class, did you talk about different types of sums of squares? Okay, then I don't have to do this horribly. Great. AOV, by default, uses a type 1. So that's a, sequ a sequential sum of squares, which means it, evaluate, it adds terms in sequentially, right? So that means that's why I told you earlier on, if you have a covariate, specify it first. Because that means that all the variance in your DV associated with the covariate is going to be removed from your model before other terms are added. Is that too fast? Do you remember what sums of squares are? <laughs> That's why I asked. Okay. So if you put that covariate last, then a sequential sums of, squ sum of squares, then that mean that means that you're going to uh, have covariate variance taken out after your model. So that's the opposite of what we do with covariates. So that's why it has to be first in the formula. Uh, if you uh, want to, you usually don't want to use type 1. Type 1 is okay in certain cases, like if you're only interested in interactions, because the interaction is always the last term and controls for everything else. If you're potentially interested in main effects, then you don't want a type 1, you want a type 2 or a type 3. In type 2s and type 3s, the problem is that the AOV command cannot do that. So you have to do it a different way. And the way that you end up doing it is by, uh, by using the general linear model and then coercing it into a NOVA output. So I'm going to show you how to do that. In brief review, though, again, remember, type 1 sum of squares is your sequential sum of squares. Type 2 is your hierarchical. It tests uh, your, uh, it adds your interaction terms after it adds in simultaneous main effects. And your type 3 is your marginal or your orthogonal sum of squares, which everything controls for everything else. In statistical circles, there's a lot of people that don't like type 3, even though that's the default in, like, SPSS. 
so if you are doing a study, you probably want one of these two, uh, either type 2 or type 3. If your design is balanced, it doesn't matter. Like, if you have equal cell sizes and it's a real experiment, like you don't have any, you don't have gender as a variable in your model, for example, because it's all experimentally controlled conditions, then it doesn't matter. Uh, type 1, type 2, and type 3 will give you almost exactly the same answer because your predictors are uncorrelated. But if you have uh, any quasi-experimental factors, if you have uh, gr non-randomly assigned groups, uh, or if you have an unbalanced design where one cell is for some reason a lot bigger than another, then they can be very different. Uh, it all depends on correlated uh, predictors. To do this, to actually run a type 2 or type 3 sum of squares, instead of this, you have to do all three of these. <coughs> The reason for this is that the, by default, the contrasts uh, that are done in an ANOVA, uh, in R, are based on treatment groups versus non-treatment groups instead of versus each group independently. So what this does, this options command, is it sets a global option for SPSS to compare everything to everything else. That's basically all it does. If you, I'm not going to go any more detail about that. At, about that, um, but you only need to, the, the thing you need to know is this sets an SPSS option, so you only need to do it one time. If you wanted to use type 2 sum of squares for five ANOVAs, just put that at the top of your file and you're done. Just make sure you run it every time. After that, you actually run a linear model using the LM command, but using the same notation that you use for AOV. Then you use the ANOVA command with a capital A. Don't use the one with a lowercase a because they both exist. You use the capital A ANOVA function uh, in order to... Uh, on the linear model in order to convert it into type 2 or type 3 output. So basically that all that means is that you already have your AOV, just replace AOV with LM, run that, and then use the capital ANOVA as your conversion to get back to ANOVA. Back to the ANOVA that you need. Okay? That makes sense? I'll show you in practice. The... Oh, yeah, and again, again this is in another package. This is in CAR. So you need to import the car package if you want to do type 2 or type 3 sum of squares. So I'm going to do library car real fast because I keep forgetting to do libraries first. Uh, and then actually I'm just going to copy paste this out because it'll be faster. First we're going to create a new data set based on an existing data set. Uh, just so you can see what I created, it is this guy right here. It is simply a data set with ACT as the first variable, gender and education as the second and third, and each of those are defined as factors in my ACT. So you can see right there, factors with two levels, factor with six levels, and an integer for ACT. So that's all that is. It's just arbitrarily creating a data set. Uh, if I look at the summary of uh, that output, I just realized I typed all those twice for no reason. Uh, you will see that I get one set of results. If I do it as an ANOVA, you'll see I get a, a somewhat different set of results. Those sums of squares have changed. Uh, the final term is identical because we have a 0.07 F value, etc. Because for type 1 or type 3 sum of squares, the last term is always controlling for all other terms. So they're the same. But you can see that these other terms have changed. The sums of squares and the f values uh, have changed. And in fact, statistical significance has changed too, based on the type that I have used. <coughs> so it is super important that you make this decision very explicitly. In SPSS, again, it defaults to type 3, so we often don't think about it. Um, but you have to make this decision very explicitly in terms of what you want to come at, what you want to happen. So in this case, for example, gender is essentially controlling for both education and the interaction, or is not controlling for either, uh, either education or the interaction term. Education is controlling for gender, but not the interaction term, and the interaction term is controlling for both of the others. And in type 3 sum of squares, everything controls for everything else. Now, I don't know how much you remember of it, but the reason that we, use, that we have advice like you can't interpret main effects in the presence of an interaction is because we use type 3 sum of squares most of the time. Uh, in a type 2 sum of squares, that's not true. But there's other disadvantages to type 2. Anyway, this is not a stats class, so that's all I'm going to say about it. Okay? Great. And, uh, oh, well, hopefully it goes without saying, if you want type 2, just change that to a 2. So, yeah. That also takes numbers. You can just use the number 2, it's, or number 3, it's the same thing. All right. Uh, other changes between uh, AOV and the linear model, uh, if you're switching to a type 3 sum of squares ANOVA, uh, remember, here is our kind of general form of a, a two-way between subjects and COVA. 
then in this case, if you need to use any of the helper functions, like ADA, A AOV, or uh, HSD, you need to do slightly different things. Number one, you always input the linear model, not the ANOVA model. So you'll remember here, you created both a linear model variable and an ANOVA model variable. ANOVA, this capital A, is essentially just output. It is not actually a model. So if you need to make results on the basis of the model, you have to use the LM. But you also have to specify the type. So here for A to squared, we input the linear model, but we have to add in this term, type equals 3. If you notice when you do A to squared that it doesn't match the results of, if you do A to squared, uh, comma, ANOVA equals T, and you notice the results are not the same as the first ANOVA, that means it's probably a, type, a sum of squares issue. You probably change sum of squares between the two without realizing it. Uh, the same thing for a APA AOV dot table. Take the linear model and add type 3. That will uh, convert all of your sum of squares into type 3s based on the linear model. And if you want to use two key HSDs, you can, but by default, two key HSD will not work in on LM unless you import this library first. If you type library mosaic, it will wrap the existing two key HSD command in another two key HSD command where the linear model will function. So if you need to do type 2 or type 3 on a linear model, you just have to load this library first. Otherwise, it's identical. Like, nothing else changes. But you have to load that library first. All right. So that is that part. Uh, I'm just checking the time for the clock in here that I can't see. There's the clock. Okay. Marginal means plots. So, again, you're going to notice that in the uh, data camp, they skipped a lot of things you actually need. Uh, so we're covering a lot of them now. Uh, one of those is marginal means plots. How do you actually calculate marginal means if you don't want to do it by hand uh, using, uh, using R? And the answer is another library. The LS means library, which stands for least squares means, has uh, a number of functions that are really useful for doing contrast tests and for doing marginal means plots. Uh, the LS means command inside LS means basically just creates a set of marginal means. Uh, so let's real quickly run through this. And I'm going to actually have to copy-paste in my options because I don't have my type 3 going. Up, done. And I'm going to go ahead and do a mosaic because why not? <coughs> All right. So if I run this guy using the same MyACT I have right now. Yo, yeah, I didn't pull age in. I should have pulled in age. Yep, I didn't pull in age. Whoops. I'm going to redefine my ACT just real quickly. Age. There we go. So now that I've added age into my ACT, I'm going to go back to linear model. If you do summary of linear model, you're going to actually get regression output with dummy codes automatically done for you. So that's why you can't just interpret that. However, if I wrap that uh, linear model in ANOVA, and just call it, you will see your traditional kind of ANOVA output. Okay, so I talked about that in the last slide, but I didn't show you. So that's all that's happening. Uh, if I do ANOVA model, ANOVA linear model, and then type ANOVA model, don't type summary in this case, just type ANOVA model, uh, or the name of your model, then you get back your, your output. By default, uh, capital ANOVA will do a type two sum of squares, so if you want to type three, you would have to specify it yourself. Uh, type equals three. And yep, and you can see that uh, these numbers changed uh, very slightly. You see a 0.192 there, 0.115. Not very big differences because the predictors aren't very correlated. Anyway, uh, once we have uh, that, we can get our marginal means by doing LS means of our linear model, and then for whatever it is we want to calculate marginal means on. So in this case, uh, the ANOVA model is gender education and age as a covariate. Uh, let's say I wanted to get marginal mean plot of education. Uh, what I need to do, library ls means. And that will give me the marginal means associated with each level of education. It will tell you it's being averaged over other variables in the model, which is what a marginal means plot is, so that's fine. Uh, and then these ls means become the scores for ls mean. So that means if you want to plot those values, this then gets treated with tidy to turn it into a data frame, and then that gets piped into ggplot so you can create the plot, okay? So, uh, yeah. So, actually, let's do... 
Let's do education by, what else is in this uh, for this guy, by gender. So that will give me a marginal mean plots of the interaction. So in this case, I have education by equals uh, gender to indicate that I'm looking for two-way marginal means. So I'm going to put that into a ggplot, and that should work. If I want the aesthetic for x equals, uh, what do I want on x? Probably gender, right? Y equals estimate, group equals education, and line equals education with a geom line. There we go. <laughs> okay. And instead of doing, uh, I could even do like color equals education, I suppose. And that would give me a marginal mean plots with each one individually split, split apart. So there you go. Uh, so that gives you the, uh, the output you need. Okay. I just did a lot of steps. <laughs> Let me uh, walk through that real quickly. Uh, what's happened here is I'm using LS means to create least square means, marginal means, on the basis of education crossed by gender. I then tidy that up to turn it into a data frame. So that's all that whole expression means. Then when I take that as a data frame in the first step in a McGritter pipe, that becomes the first term in ggplot, right? ggplot data frame comma. So that's ignored because I piped it in. And then I just created, just like we did uh, last time, uh, a ggplot using x as gender, y as the estimate, because that's the marginal mean, group as education, line as education, because I want them to be split apart by education, and they created geom line. Right. Contrast test. Also from the ls means package, uh, you can use the command contrast and put the word model, comma, list, and then in this list you put all the contrasts you want. So this is the same as in SPSS when you do plan contrasts, you know, specify minus 0.5, minus 0.5, 1 to contrast two groups versus another group. Same idea, you just put them in a, in a vector, in a C, uh, and then give it a name. It doesn't matter what the name is, and you can put multiple contrasts in this list if you want to do multiple plan contrasts. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're using AOV or LM because it's a plan test, which means sum of squares is not relevant. You are just doing uh, direct mean comparisons with some sort of corrected uh, uh, standard error metric, so it doesn't really matter which one to use. Uh, you might use GLHT in uh, certain cases. If you have a multi-way, if you're trying to do uh, particularly complex contrasts, my understanding is you need GLHT for them, but for everything that I tried, it worked, uh, it worked okay. So, um, so yeah, with contrasts, for example, here I'm contrasting the, low, the first two groups with the last two groups and ignoring the middle two groups but still using their information to calculate standard errors. In this last one, I'm looking at the lowest group and the largest group, in this case, in education. So you calculate your marginal means first, and then you specify your contrast on your marginal means. That's all it is. All right, so here's a full workflow example of what you might be doing um, with ANOVA. Uh, in this case, I want to do type 3 sum of squares on a... Uh, I actually flipped it around. Oh, it doesn't matter here. Uh, doing a uh, type 3 sum of squares model on a two-way ANCOVA. So I have first specified the original data set itself. Second, I've set the options to enable uh, the correct comparisons when doing type 2 or type 3s. Uh, set, next, I've created a linear model uh, with the uh, model that I'm interested in. In this case, I do have age at the end, but it doesn't matter because it's a type 3. If it was a type 1, the order would matter, but it doesn't here. Uh, for a NOVA model, I then specify type equals 3 in order to get that output. I could also just type the word ANOVA underscore model at this point to get the the, about the, the table that I want, if I want to look at it. Uh, I create a new marginal means uh, data frame using tidy on LS means on the specific combination that I want to look at the interaction for. I then create a GG plot, uh, in this case using error bars and dodge. Uh, if you run this yourself, that's actually a really super cool looking graph uh, and took me a few minutes to put together. Uh, then we have uh, your basic geom line down here, uh, this time using group and color. Uh, so this is just to get, if you wanted an error bar type marginal means plot where you just have each individual, you know, uh, box plot for each of your marginal means, that's the way you would do it. If you want to have the traditional line like I just showed you, you would do this. Uh, and then finally, uh, an APA AOV table would then save the results of your ANOVA to a file. So these are the steps, kind of the basic steps involved. If you want to do additional contrast tests, if you want to do different post hoc tests, if you want to do whatever else you would add to this. But this is the basic kind of idea. Uh, create the groundwork, create the model, visualize the model, and then print out results. That's like the workflow. Okay. All right. Here's your summary. These are all the things I talked about. 
Uh, would strongly recommend using these slides as a reference guide for all of this, uh, because to be honest, this took me like 15 hours to put together to find all of these materials, having never done ANOVAs in R before, uh, before this. Uh, so there's a lot of different functions that are super useful, uh, and they're not centrally located and they're all in different places. Uh, we have uh, summary, AOV, t-test, all the basic stats tests. Uh, you also see, oh, that should be Shapiro, I don't know why that got cut off. Um, citation and find are all in base R. Citation, by the way, is a useful function. Uh, because if you're using something customized to a particular uh, data set, like say I'm, I extensively use ggplot, I can type uh, citation ggplot, and that has to be a vector, and I always do that backwards. Uh, oh, ggplot2, sorry. And that will actually give you a more or less citation to how you would get it. It's not, it sometimes it's an APA and sometimes it's not because it's written by the person that wrote the package. But it at least gets you most of the way there to what it is. In this case, you can see there's actually a book about ggplot. So if you wanted to cite ggplot, you should cite this book. Um, so the citation function is really useful uh, if you need to cite things in papers. Tidyverse, we use gather, transmute, and ggplot, which are actually, again, in the tidier dplyr and ggplot2 libraries. If you do library tidyverse, you get all those by default, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, but if you do them individually, you'd have those three. APA tables has our tables commands. Broom is where tidy is. Car is where Levine test and the capital A ANOVA is. Uh, LSR is where ADA squared is. Mosaic is where the wrapper around the basic 2-key HSD is. These are really identical, except that Mosaic's 2-key HSD lets you do it on LM. So that's the only difference. So if you need a type 2 or type 3, you have to call, call Mosaic first. Multicomp is uh, GLHT is. Um, which is useful for other for post hoc tests that 2K HSD won't do, or if you want something that you can't get with basic uh, comparisons. Psych has described, described by, and these two data sets that so will work with a lot VFI and SAT.ACT, and YAR has the pirate plot. So when you're going through this, would recommend. If you look at uh, the assignment, for example, and it says calculate post hoc tests, then you probably want to go through here and look at the review the material and post hoc tests, which functions they require, then go back to this page and see, well, where are the specific functions that I need actually located? All of these can be installed in RStudio using install.packages with quotes that threw off some people last time, um, except, again, for multi-comp. Multi-comp has to be installed in our GUI. So don't run RStudio for that. Run R, raw R, and install multi-comp, and that will get you the GLHT, GLHT package. Ha! Huh. That's it.